If you've ever spent an entire lunch hour just staring at a map of the United States, people do that, right? You've probably noticed this line that seems to run right across the middle of the entire country. Why is that line there? Well, to figure that out, we're going to have to go back to the beginning. When the United States gained independence and the Founding Fathers got together to write a constitution, it was pretty much assumed that slavery was naturally going to die out. Soon. Let me be clear, it wasn't because of any altruistic reason or movement towards equality, but because it simply wasn't profitable. That's right, even 200 years ago, all anyone cared about was their bottom line. But because it was dying out and because the US wanted to at least appear to be on the right side of history, they wrote it into the Constitution that the importation of new slaves would only be allowed until 1808, at which point it was made illegal. Although that didn't really stop it either for reasons I'll get to later. Slavery was up to the states. They could decide whether to abolish it or allow it. And coincidentally, most of the northern states abolished it. Again, not because racism was over, but because it was simply more trouble than it was worth. Literally. So let's take a look at a map and see what the South was really worried about. The problem with looking at modern maps like this in order to explain slavery is that it isn't an accurate representation of what the US was going through. So let's take a look at what the US looked like in 1813. We had just started a war with Great Britain, had bought the Louisiana Territory a few years earlier, and had 18 states. 9 free, shown in blue, and 9 slave, in red. At this point, there were just over a million slaves in the United States, and only 7 million people total, so about 16% of the population was slaves. And slavery had just become profitable. When the Constitution was written, slaves were really only used for one crop. And it's not the crop you're thinking of. It was tobacco and sugar in the Caribbean, but sugar doesn't grow so well in the United States, so just tobacco. The crop you were thinking of, cotton, was extremely unprofitable. This is what cotton looks like, and those seeds are not easy to take out. It took one slave an entire day to process one pound of cotton. To put that into perspective, a cotton shirt weighs half a pound, so one slave could make enough cotton to make two shirts a day. You obviously didn't have to pay them wages, but you did have to house and feed them, which was extremely difficult on only two shirts a day. So really, slavery was on its way out, at least until Eli Whitney's cotton gin, one of the most important inventions in human history, because it kept slavery alive. Now, instead of one slave making one pound, one slave could make 50 pounds. It's pretty easy to justify the cost of keeping slaves when their profitability increases 50 times over. From the time the cotton gin was invented until the Civil War, the amount of slaves in the United States quintupled, from just under 700,000 in 1790 to nearly 4 million in 1860. So even though the importation of slaves was banned in 1808, that law was passed before slavery was profitable. So even though a combined US and British naval task force gave it their best college try, the trade continued. Thanks, Eli Whitney. But let's go back to this map. Tobacco and cotton were the big products in the South and the main economic driver of slavery. You couldn't grow those in the North. You could really only grow corn and wheat, which you needed animal labor for, not human. So nobody really wanted to expand slavery northwards, but we did have all this fun new land to the West, which most people estimated would take several hundred years for America to expand into. As a wise man once said, if there's one thing that we're worse at than not murdering each other, it's predicting the future. Anyway, after the Lewis and Clark expedition, it was pretty much figured out that the land wasn't going to be very useful when it came to cash crops, but it was pretty useful in the fur department. By 1817, we had evened the teams up to 10 on 10 with Mississippi and Indiana, but fast forward to 1819. At this point, we had agreed to jointly occupy the Oregon country with the British, further leading to the genocide of the buffalo, beaver, and uh, some people. We also uh, permanently borrowed Florida from Spain, which wasn't very useful for cash cash crops either. We had added Alabama and Illinois, bringing us up to 22 states, but now we had a problem. It was becoming pretty obvious to the South that the space left for the US to expand into wasn't very useful for slavery. And while the House of Representatives is apportioned by population, the Senate makes every state equal. So at this point, there were 22 free state senators and 22 slave state senators. The Senate was what kept slavery at least legally safe, so they wanted to keep that equality. So in 1820, they struck a deal known as the Missouri Compromise, which legally mandated what the US had already sort of been doing. Always two there are, no more, no less. 
a free state and a slave state. The next two territories up to bat for statehood were Missouri and Maine, and no new slave states would be admitted above this line, 36 degrees, 30 minutes north latitude. This is slavery's scar on the United States. Roll credits. Before we get too deep into the compromise, some of you with a keen eye might have noticed that Maine was already colored blue in the 1813 map. Was it already a state? Yes, but it was part of Massachusetts, which is why it's a major expansion in Fallout 4. But they wanted to break away and become their own state. How did they come up with the name for this state? Well, first, you have to understand that very few people lived on Maine proper. They mostly lived on islands off the coast. And anyone who lives in or grew up in Hawaii can explain to you that when you live on an island, the rest of the country that's on the continent is known as the mainland. And that's how they came up with the name, Maine. Not very creative, but still interesting, right? So back to the map. In 1837, Arkansas and Michigan were added. Whatever. The real interesting addition to this map is Texas, which got its independence from Mexico in 1836. And while it really wanted to be part of the United States, the United States didn't want it because of its recent divorce with Mexico. Anyone who's ever dated a recent divorcee can tell you that there's a lot of baggage, not least of which is trouble with the ex. But I've already talked about Texas enough in my previous videos, so I don't want to give them much more screen time. Not to mention, you can't really grow anything in Texas. So while Texas did have slaves, they were mostly ranching country. Anyway, in 1846, Florida and Iowa were added, and then in 1848, Wisconsin and... Oh, for... Texas was added. But wait, what happened to all that Texas territory that went up into Wyoming? Well, Texas was a slave state, and that was above the line. So they cut it off and gave it to what would become Oklahoma. Which is why Oklahoma has a panhandle. There, are you happy now? I finally answered it. But we had also gained all of this new territory from Mexico that year. Unfortunately, it's not very good for growing any cash crops or anything else for that matter. In fact, the US had pretty much statified all of its good cotton growing land. So in 1850, when California became a state, they ran into a new problem. They had thought about dividing California in two, California and Colorado, which I discussed in a previous video. But California didn't really want to be divided up. So instead, they decided that California had to send one free and one slave senator. Always two there are. Which was difficult because there really wasn't that much slavery going on there. California is good farming land for fruits and vegetables, but not really anything that slavery would make profitable. But they went with it, at least until 1854. Kansas and Nebraska were up for statehood, but both of them were above the magic line. One was good for growing corn, the other for wheat. Again, not really suited for slavery crops. So they did away with the compromise and decided that the people in the state should decide whether they are free or not, an idea known as popular sovereignty. The problem with this, of course, was that suddenly Kansas was being flooded with people from other states, slave owners and abolitionists, hoping to sway the vote one way or another. Which, if we're going to talk about the actual start of the Civil War, this is where the fighting began, in what became known as Bleeding Kansas. In 1860, Kansas decided to become a free state, and their constitution passed in the House but was stalled in the Senate over the issue of slavery. Four months later, the Civil War started, which by the way is why Washington DC looks like this and not like this. But this also happened to coincide with Lincoln taking office, and it's a commonly held belief that he is the reason why the Confederacy broke away. But Lincoln never campaigned for abolition and never said anything about wanting to free the slaves. It's kind of the 1860 version of people saying Obama wants to take away your guns. Lincoln wants to take your slaves, despite all evidence to the contrary. In fact, a year into the war, Lincoln wrote a letter saying, If I could save the Union without freeing any slave, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing all of the slaves, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing some and leaving others alone, I would also do that. That last one, coincidentally, is what he ended up doing with the Emancipation Proclamation. It only freed the slaves in any area in active rebellion. So the slave states which were loyal to the Union, occupied Tennessee, and the Union occupied areas of New Orleans and Virginia were able to keep their slaves. It wasn't until the war was ended and the 13th Amendment was passed that slavery ended completely. So was the Civil War about slavery? Yes, and to say otherwise is simply wrong. For the North, it was about preserving the Union and ending a rebellion. For the South, it was a last-ditch effort to keep slavery because it was becoming increasingly obvious that Western expansion was going to end it for them. The Civil War was not inevitable. That saying is part of the lost cause myth. 
which tries to explain it away as part of the growing banes of the United States. They were just acting out, you know, like a teenager. It was the end of slavery that was inevitable. So while even people like Robert E. Lee acknowledged that Actually, I'll let him speak for himself. The blacks are immeasurably better off here than in Africa, morally, physically, and socially. The painful discipline they are undergoing is necessary for their further instruction as a race, and will prepare them, I hope, for better things. How long their servitude may be necessary is known and ordered by a merciful providence. This influence, though slow, is sure. While we see the course of the final abolition of human slavery is still onward, and give it the aid of our prayers, let us leave the progress as well as the results in the hands of him who chooses to work by slow influences and with whom a thousand years is but a single day. Although the abolitionist must know this, must know that he has neither the right nor the power of operating, except by moral means, that to benefit the slave he must not excite the angry feelings in the master. So to paraphrase, slavery will end eventually. Now don't be hasty. But it's not our place to end it before God wills it. Our thoughts and prayers are with them during this instructional transition. And also, in order to benefit the slave, one must not anger the master. Yeah, this one goes out to all the people who think Robert E. Lee was one of the good ones and didn't fight for slavery. So the next time someone tries to tell you that the Civil War was fought over states' rights, or that the Civil War was inevitable, hopefully now, you'll know better. Hey guys, tomorrow is my one year anniversary, so stay tuned for a video with some special announcements. But if you enjoyed this video or you learned something, make sure to give that like button a click. If you'd like to see more from me, I put out new videos every Sunday, so make sure to emancipate that subscribe button. Also make sure to follow me on Facebook and Twitter and join the conversation on the Reddit. In the meantime, if you'd like to watch one of my older videos, how about this one?